Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. We are podcasting about the 11th Sunday after Pentecost on August 8, 2021. You've got choices for your first reading. The thematic is 1 Kings 19, 4 through 8. Or if you are a semi-continuous person, it is 2 Samuel chapter 18, selected verses. The psalm is Psalm 34, 1 through 8. The second reading is Ephesians 4, 25 through 5, 2. And from the gospel according to St. John, chapter 6, verses 35 and 41 through 51. Our third in the John 6 detour, or maybe we should say, uh, you know, the climax of the entire year B lectionary cycle, talking about bread of life. Right. People start I, complaining. They do start complaining, but... Uh, I'm going to say this, that uh, it, would, it would be very helpful uh, and actually critical for the preacher either to add verses to this selection or at least look at the verses uh, that we get that are left off the lection, that is verses 36 through 40, uh, because what you were getting in verse 41 uh, is is a uh, various kinds of references to what is going to be the response to what Jesus is saying, and will people see Jesus, this sign as what it what it's meant to reveal or what it's meant to point to or not? And so we can al already see, like verse thirty five, of course, was the last verse of of the lection last week. And now we've picked up it again. So already you're seeing that this is, you know, this is an ongoing, um, this is an ongoing discourse. But, but what we get in verses 36 through 40 uh, is 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 in many respects an encapsulation of John 3, 16 through 21. That I uh, that that what what this gospel really holds together. Uh, and is and is really critical here, uh, particularly when we get to the end of the bread of life discourse. And there's some of the disciples that fall away; they leave. They're like, "I, you know, I, I can't. This is this is too hard. I can't do this. I don't I get this." I understand What's that? their pain. I understand them. Yeah. Well, I, exactly. But it's it's this in verses 36 and 40. What we see is we have freedom to respond to this um, and i uh, and that in in and what we get then is yes there's there's god's initial action toward the world <laughs> uh, in john you know john 316 uh, and and god's initiative right in giving us jesus but there is at the same time, how will we respond to it? That's what, that's, that's what John 3, 17 to 21 is all about. This is, the, this is the crisis. This is the moment of decision. How will you see who Jesus is? And so uh, I, I think you, you either add it or the preacher at least needs to recognize that um, the response in a 41 of the Jewish authorities or the, the presence of the Jewish authorities here, which is really going to pick up in chapter seven and eight, uh, is this complaining. And it's, uh, and then it's all about Jesus' identity. They were saying, isn't this not Jesus, a son of Joseph, whose father and mother, mother we know? How can he say I've come down from heaven? And so it, it, the, the response that we're getting in this section is, is questions about Jesus' identity. Uh, are, you, are you recognizing that the sign that Jesus has performed and the way in which Jesus is talking about this uh, is, 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 is pointing to Jesus, you know, Jesus, God's presence in Jesus. And so uh, I, think that's an, I think that's an important backdrop to this section because then Jesus is going to go on 
and say um, like verse 45, everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. So you see all these different kinds of reactions of hearing and learning and seeing and recognizing, which, um, which comes down to, yeah, will they again see that this is who Jesus is? So that's my first comment, which was a long comment, I know. How is this passage good news to the gluten intolerant? <sighs> Caroline, can you explain that? Well, there is um, there are a lot of gluten free options these days. So there you go. I yeah. um yep. I I or if love... you're on a low carb diet, you know, um, there's uh, low carb bread, as I it, am. So oh, there you go. So. But three times, I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. I am the living bread. Uh, mm -hmm. But then the but then the promise: um, whoever eats this bread will live forever, uh, and uh, also will never be hungry and will never thirst. You know that is, uh, which I you know I take that the hunger and thirsting as as metaphor for spiritual hunger and thirsting, not as obviously absolute. Um, Beyond th people thinking about this as simply participating in uh, the sacrament of Holy Communion, though, how is this? How does this shape our spiritual lives to think of ourselves as being fed by the bread of life? I think so, a lot of people just reduce it. Yep, I get that at communion. Mm, mm -hmm. I think, and I think it's a lot more than that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I asked the two of you what you think that means. I, I, I worry. I, I'm going to jump in because I know Caroline has multiple points. So um, I worry about the way that gets tied together with the I've come down from heaven and I'll raise you up. So the, you know, the Johannine language of, of the descending son of man and the reascending son of man, because if it if it reinforces this idea of a spirituality that's a that's a tie to a, another place to a, to somewhere else, um, to this idea of a heaven up there where Jesus resides, sending down blessings to me, and that the idea of being caught up in in the love that he talks about later in this gospel is a kind of escape from this world. I do worry about that 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 the spiritualizing of of this idea of bread and being fed. Can lead to a kind of escapism with a simplistic reading of John, um, and I. So I, I just want to. I, I would like people to explore that. As things that are already present in their own lives and their own existence, do you know what I mean? As opposed to seeing it as. Kind of like a kind of quasi mystical escape from this world to connect with Jesus and. And all of His promises. So yeah. I want them to see that in service. I want them to see that in worship. I want to see them, have them see that in their own relationships. Yeah. That's all. Well, I think, I think what might be helpful in that regard is that, that the claim of I am the bread that came down from heaven and that's in verse 41. First of all, he says, I am the bread of life, right? In verse 35, there's a progression here or there are ways that's really one of the, one of the tricks of interpreting the farewell discourse. Or I mean, the uh, bread of life discourse is, is recognizing that, that what Jesus says, it keeps building and building and building, right? So it, uh, first it's, I am the bread of life. Then it's, um, then in verse 41, I am the bread that came down from heaven and which is really pointing and then well, let me say this, then verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. So none, are all those the same? Maybe not. That, you, that we really think of each of these phrases or each, each of these identifiers of Jesus as, as pointing to a different reality that a different kind of gift or, or offering that Jesus is providing. And when Jesus says, I am the bread that came down from heaven, Yes, it is a direct reference to Exodus and the manna and the and the you know the manna that falls from the sky. And yes, you could, uh, you 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 could kind of separate that that out as sort of a you know a separate spiritual realm. I think what concretizes this 
uh, and maybe corrects that is to is to what extent to say I am the bread that came down from heaven is a restatement of John 1 1 that um, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You know, where does Jesus come from? Jesus comes from God. And so heaven is not necessarily, a, you know, the, the firmament or like this, this, you know, other spiritual realm as it is so much saying Jesus origin is from outside of time. <laughs> Um, from God. And, and part of the urgency of recognizing Jesus here and now is the temporality of the incarnation. You know, the incarnation is not going to last. Uh, and so what, what's caught up in this discourse is questions of Jesus identity, questions of Jesus origin, and then of course the relationship that he offers, which is all in John 1.1. I think that's incredibly helpful. I mean, I, when you see the incarnation is not going to last, I think you mean, do you, are you saying the presence of Jesus among us is not going to last or the- Yeah, he's going to die. I need presence in the same way. Yeah. He's going to die, but he's also going to ascend. He's going to, you know- Right, the, right, exactly. I, th I think all that's really helpful because I do think most people still operate with a kind of we're here, God's out there. Every now and then God pokes through and- Mm -hmm. sends me a parking space or you know I mean it's subtle but it I, I think there's a reorientation here of the idea of where is God and how is God encountered mm -hmm. that we need to tend to mm -hmm. I appreciate how you said that especially how it's more temporal or it's more the sense of from where does he originate yeah mm -hmm. and that's part of that's part of what that's a, that's a major theme of this gospel, and it's part of what's getting revealed in this sign, that uh, that Jesus is not of, of Jesus' identity, but that Jesus is from God, and Jesus is the I am, and so it um, we can't really separate those out. And I, you know, one of the really hard things about this gospel is uh, even though the incarnation is temporal. You know, it is limited in that Jesus will be crucified and then he will ascend to the Father. At the same time, you have, you'll get in the farewell discourse, of course, you know, in my father's house, there are many abiding places uh, that, that we actually have this relationship here and now, even though the incarnation isn't here. And so it, that it, I, I frankly can't understand it, <laughs> but that's the point. You know what I mean? Like, the, there, there is, be, because God entered into time, how we construe time, particularly in a linear context or in a linear way, we can't do that anymore. That this gospel doesn't allow us to kind of plot our relationship with God in a linear fashion, or that it's uh, that our or our experience of God, or experience of Jesus, and kind of the way we want to plot time and mark time, it's not going to work anymore because time has been completely disrupted uh, when God enters into our time. And you said this last week: we can't read eternal life as just quantity of time or consecutive or, time we have okay. to read it as a qualitatively different type of life yes right yes that's it mm -hmm. yeah that's all i got on john six all right i'm so guessing one of you has more well i want to go back i want to give carolyn a chance to answer the question i asked which is other than participating in holy communion how do we feed on the living bread, the bread of life, like throughout the week, throughout the day? I mean, one way is to think about just, you know, getting the scripture in, right? Bible study, devotions, prayer, um, connecting, uh, connecting with, the, with the presence of the triune God who is with us always. Uh, any, any other ways to think about adding to that? Because, you know, some, I, I think a lot of people just reduce the idea of I am the bread of life to that, mm -hmm. you know, five minute ritual on Sundays. 
Well, yeah, and I think that's, I mean, you pointing back to verse 35, I am the bread of life, whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty, uh, that, that, and, you know, and I've said this before, but the, the offering of Jesus, you know, of himself to the Samaritan woman is not to make sure that she's, you know, that she doesn't ever need a drink again. <laughs> and the offering of Jesus here as, as, as the bread, it doesn't mean, you know, like you said, doesn't mean um, we're never going to be hungry again. What the offering here is, um, is relationship. And so I think, I think you said it well uh, um, earlier, Rolf, is that it's what is it that we do during the week that sustains that relationship, that keeps that relationship front and center, uh, that, that, that reminds us of that relationship or affirms that relationship. And so you could even like, you could even, uh, I think fast forward in the, in the discourse where Peter says, Simon Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I mean, there is no other place to go as part of what's happening here. And so, all of all of the ways in which we, uh, all of the ways in which we stay, you know, to use another Johanna metaphor, connected to the vine, <laughs> is really what is really what this is about. Um, so it's whether that's um, you know whether that's uh, how we're how we're we're not just nurturing our spiritual life, right? We're not just sustaining a spiritual life. We're that for John spiritual life is fundamentally um, how is it that you're in this real relationship with God and that that that's that's the center of how you go about your your week and your life that's what God wants it's not we don't do it just to be because we're supposed to or because uh, you know that we think we should and that's what you do as a disciple we we also there because that's what God wants that's the whole point of this gospel it's like I want to be in relationship with you. Yeah, and <laughs> and that in that relationship, God nourishes us yeah. for the hard things that we have to do. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So, First Kings nineteen, I, I I'm getting a little crabby with these little thumbnail bits of stories that are pulled out to pair with the John six. So, first the manna, then um, you know under uh, then you got the. Uh, the Baal Shalisha last week. I love this story so much, and I'm really mad that we only get this piece of it. Mm. Um, other than, because here it's just uh, thematically paired. So you can see, oh yeah, there's a time God did that in the Old Testament where uh, Elijah was running away. But so, you know, if you're tired of preaching on uh, John 6, it might be a fun time to take out and do like the entire story of first Kings 19, where you get kind of Israel's Northern Israel, the Northern kingdom's most successful prophet, Elijah, you know, he's just uh, overcome the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, had this major victory. And then he finds out the queen's going to kill him. And so he runs away into the wilderness and lies down and wants to die. Uh, Like another, uh, it's interesting, uh, one of my friends pointed out to me that all of the people in the Old Testament who ask to die uh, don't, at least not at that point in their lives. Uh, So, um, you know, like Jonah and here's Elijah, but um, he's given up. He's given up on God after God has just magnificently presented God's self at Mount Carmel. And so then this is really the story of God. Then then he goes all the way to Mount Horeb, which is the Northern Kingdom's name for Mount Sinai. And and the rest of the story is, you know, how God, uh, there's an earthquake and a fire and a wind, but God isn't in those. God is in the still small voice or the silence, depending on who's translating it. And then God says, look, I got plans beyond you. You're not the only one left. Uh, There's something um, martyrish, self-martyrish. And I don't mean that in the the positive sense, but like 
woe is me. I'm the only one left. Don't worry about me. I'll carry my own grave. I'll carry my own shovel to my grave. I'll be fine. Right. That, you know, that, that kind of narrative that this story does away with and talks about God's presence in more than just those mighty moments, but, and that God is present in other people and God's mission is uh, going to be sustained beyond Elijah. God reassures Elijah. And, you know, this is maybe for churches that are fearing, uh, that are just terrified by the decline of Christianity in our culture. This is a promise that God's sustaining of the community of faith will happen. Any, uh, should we do the Psalm then? Um, since we're stay on that same sort of connection theme. Yeah. I mean, this is, um, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yeah, I suppose. I have frequently, uh, I, I wrote I wrote a, oh, this was a really long time ago, but I was one of the co-authors of New Proclamation. Remember that? And I think, I think both of you have done that as well. And of course, one of the things that you have to do with, uh, with that particular writing assignment is to make these lectionary connections. And and I've, so I've, I have frequently, and I frequently talk about this in my, uh, my introductory preaching course uh, of when you, you know, when you have these pairings of the lectionary that um, I often, I actually always quote you, Rolf, where I say, use the lectionary, but don't inhale. Thank you. And, uh, and, but that this is a lovely, this is a lovely pairing in that Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How could this be a refrain uh, for the service, for your sermon, uh, where you're the, that, that it, be, it becomes, yeah, it becomes this mantra, if you will, or this, this phrase that we repeat over and over again, that that is what, that's what John 6 is saying. And that's what the uh, passage, um, the, 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 the thematic um, Old Testament lesson is saying as well. So that's I, that's how I would use the that's how I would use the psalm. I think it's okay just to pluck a verse out of it. This is this is one of those acrostic psalms, and so each line starts with a successive a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is why it doesn't seem to have any form because the form is artificial um, rather than being a lament or a praise psalm. Um, but it's got it. But it does it does have. Um, you know, several of those great, um, great lines. I, I, I think that, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, if, if you check out Deuteronomy 14, uh, the last laws in Deuteronomy 14, it talks about throwing a feast, uh, taking your tithes and throwing a feast, but remembering to invite also the widow and the orphan and the priest and the alien. And one of the things that people would do in the ancient uh, in ancient Israel is when you received um, re some sort of uh, redemptive grace from God, rescue from a disease or from some other form of oppression or trauma, not oppression, some other form of trauma, is um, to throw a celebratory feast. And um, I think that's what this is probably a lot. Uh, this line is a reference to that that kind of moment. Um, one of the things I've done, uh, I'm now, it's it's over 40 years since I um, was first diagnosed with cancer and had my first amputation. And on anniversaries, big anniversaries now, not every year, um, throw a feast uh, uh, with family and uh, close friends um, at, to commemorate, you know, the, the, you know, this, this poor soul cried to the Lord, it says here, and was saved. And so taste and see that the Lord is good. And I think, I think, I know a lot of my friends that have also had cancer uh, do very similar or have some other major trauma, which they survived, do similar things. All right, the semi-continuous. A few years have passed in Second Samuel. Just last. a few. Yeah, uh, I realized, you know, I really like the semi-continuous option, uh, but it is very frustrating at times um, how big the leaps are. Mm -hmm. and they don't give you any context. Mm -hmm. um, the most important bit of context here uh, is that Absalom uh, has rebelled against David. 
his and had had a coup. In order to understand that, though, you got to go back a little ways. So speaking of uh, rape stories, David's a terrible father. Um, his son, Ab um, Amnon, uh, had raped Absalom's uh, full sister. So he has Amnon by one wife, Absalom and Tamar by another wife. And Amnon rapes Tamar. So, Absol so David refuses to punish Amnon because he's a terrible father. Uh, this is my opinion. Uh, if, you, if you disagree, that's fine. Not talking about, not talking about you. I just don't want any letters about it. So then uh, Absalom uh, gets, is frustrated that his dad won't punish his half-brother. So Absalom kills him. So David uh, forces him into exile, but then allows him to come back uh, in a few years. And then Absalom uh, organizes a coup. He sits outside the city. And by the way, this is a great story for people to know. And so one of the jobs of the king was to be the judge. And so people would come and bring a dispute to David. You know, the best example of this is, uh, the best story of this is in Solomon where the two uh, women are arguing, each claim to be the mother of a, of a child. That's the, a famous example of it. But so every, every person who gets the, the negative judgment from David, Absalom sits on the edge of the city and says, well, if I were king, I, I, would, I, would, have given, I would have judged for you. And so he, he uh, I, I think that's a great story because there are people like that in our lives that you know present themselves as our allies, but then behind the scene are undermining us. Um, we uh, every leader has experienced that. I have for sure experienced that uh, uh, several times in my life. Absalom rebels, and then Absalom is defeated, and this then is the end of that story. So you got to know all of that to get this story. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, this uh, the the ancient version of being hoisted on his own petard. Absalom has this uh, hair he's proud of, but when he's riding, he gets caught uh, in his hair. Am I rem yes, his head or not his hair, but his head gets caught fast in the tree, and he's hanging there between heaven and earth. And uh, David's um, soldiers don't uh, have mercy on him. And then all of that to get to the very poignant cry that David still loves his son. Mm -hmm. David still loves his son who has killed one of his other sons, who has undermined him, rebelled against him, led a coup. And um, I think that is... A poignant story, and then and then a reminder that God still loves us. Mm. Okay, that was sort of me monologuing, sort of like it's I'm the villain fine. in a Bond movie. <laughs> Where's the reminder that God still loves us in this? <laughs> it's a long way to go for that lesson, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's you're right about all the those details. the The final verse is, of course beautiful and and speaks to the lament i think not only of parents who lose children but especially that mm -hmm. and even especially if it's a child who has been mm -hmm. disobedient wayward from the perspective of some got what was coming to them that a parent would still say i would trade my life for you and so there are those stories of course residing um, in congregations and and I would almost pull this passage entirely out of context, out of the larger Davidic narrative and just say mm -hmm. um, the Bible uh, often teaches us things about God. Sometimes the Bible just puts an issue in front of us on the table and says, any of you all ever feel like this? And this is one of those mm -hmm. stories. That, that would be a great way into it. Yeah. Uh, that's great. I like that's that fantastic. a lot. Yeah. Then of course right. you have to find a way to address that grief, and but you're all mm -hmm. you're all preachers, you know how to do that. <laughs> well, I mean, all of us, um, you know. But my dad said that that to me when I got cancer, I felt that way. When my kids have had their health problems, you much rather it happened to you, right? And I know that from my friends who have lost kids. 
So yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, so five out of seven readings of Ephesians. Am I counting correctly? We have two more after this. Yeah, well, and you said back at week one, don't skip the household code. This is a passage you could trade out for the household code if you're if you're up for it. But I think so too. Or <laughs> uh, or you just like um, put this in front of everybody and say, you know, um, let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up. Uh, put away from you all bitterness, wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice, be kind to one each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. There, I want you, and I would just say, okay, I want you to repeat this every single day this week, every single day. I want you, I want you to wake up, do your meditation and do that. That's how I would use this passage. You think that'll fix things? Uh, no, probably not, but it'll just remind people of what they're supposed to not do. That's true. Yeah. I think it'd be really satisfying <laughs> as a preacher too, just to say it. Yeah, I think so too. And like, you know, and say, Hey, Hey, how many, how many of you have um, lived by the lived by this lately? You know, um, where if you pick and choose what you're going to live live by from scripture um, or you use scripture to you know justify your behavior uh, do any of you pay attention to this so that's that's my advice for Ephesians this, this week <laughs>